Hello, today is December 9th, 2008, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This interview is a part of the Morse Institute Library's Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our videographer today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. And today we welcome Faith W. Peak to our program. Thank you, Faith, for coming in today. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Good. I'm pleased to be here for this. Thank you. May I ask you your age? Yes, 81. Uh, uh, my birthday is April 10th, 1927. And you live in Natick? Natick for three years now. And prior to Natick, where did you live? I lived 30 years in Hyannis on Cape Cod, right on the water. A beautiful place to live, but Natick is too. And you are widowed? Yes, as of four years ago. And do you have children? I have two lovely daughters. Sarah and her husband Chris live in Belchertown, Massachusetts, near Amherst, and Joy and Andy live in Wellesley. Now, is Sarah in politics? No, um, she's in human, no, uh, she's in community housing. Okay. It's Joy who's in human resources. Okay. <laughs> and you have grandchildren? One precious boy, uh, seven going on eight soon, and that's Blake. And Faith, where were you born? I was born in Binghamton, New York, where my father was born, and we lived there a while, then moved to Quincy. Quincy, Mass? Yes. And you were raised in Quincy? Until I was six, and then we moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And what brought your family to Massachusetts? Well, uh, my mother's folks were in Massachusetts, in Arlington, and then... Um, uh, my grandmother lived across the street from us and my aunt around the corner in Quincy. And Dad had been a 1911 graduate from Harvard. And when he was there, he always wanted to move back to Cambridge, which we did in a time when he was looking for work. And he found it. Um, as a night watchman to begin with, and that led to two other jobs. In the Christian Science Center, he was in the publishing house, and then he became 40 years custodian of the Mother Church. For and the Christian Science Group? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how many siblings do you have, or did you I have? had one brother. Mm -hmm. Uh, he died at 16, which was very sad for my parents and me too. That he, had to be very difficult. Was he older or younger than you? He was four years older than mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. and um, he was tops in his class in grammar school, had a scholarship to Brown and Nichols, and was headed in his eyes to Harvard but never got there. Sure, sure, that had to be difficult. Well, he was such a bright, uh, happy person to all of us in the family that um, we remembered the good things. Yes. He was in rowing on the Charles River. Mm -hmm. He was the coxswain beating the time yes. for, the, for the oars and um, he came to my parents all unhappy one day, and he said, this is our last rowing competition, and at the end, if we win, I get thrown in the Charles River with all the dirt. <laughs> Will I be able to swim and get to the dock? And he was a good swimmer, and mother and dad and calmed him down and said that was going to be just fine and what if you lose? Well, I don't have to go in. Sure. And um, they won. He did it fine and got to the dock and was glad the folks had encouraged him. Sure, sure. Now why did you move to Natick from Hyannis? 
My daughter Joy uh, lived on Point Street here in Natick, and the two daughters helped me. I, I didn't realize it, but with very little time, I made an announcement, I'm moving and selling the house. And uh, they decided if they had a summer house, both of them would head toward New Hampshire, Vermont or so, and not south to the Cape. So I announced I was selling the house and moving at a certain time frame. And now they tell me it was very short for doing what we needed to do. You gave them short notice. And they helped in every respect, all four. And uh, they, we uh, sent, oh, they, both Sarah and Joy came here and brought me here and took me around to four different places that were for rent. And uh, this was lovely, but something and something else was very good, but far from what I'd be doing. And um, we, I went home and said, well, if you see anything else in the paper, and that Sunday, the, the house that I'm in now was listed. And she said, Mother, I went down the street. I just saw the outside, but it makes me think of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, when can you come? I said, I can be there tomorrow noon. <laughs> and that Monday, I came up and met her. And it was the house. and where I'm living now. That's perfect. When you were growing up in Cambridge, did you graduate from high school in Cambridge? I graduated from Peabody Grammar School mm -hmm. and Cambridge High in Latin, and I started in Wheelock College in Boston. I was there a year, and illness put me out, but uh, I would take courses at Harvard with the um, Harvard Cooperative courses. And what kind of courses did you take back then? Well, English and history. Um, there was a professor from the West, and I knew of the college, and he was teaching um, either history or geography course, and that I wanted to take and did. And there was grading for that, and uh, there was one essay question for the test at the end. Compare the United Nations and the League of Nations, I still remember. Yeah. And I sat with my pen poised, not writing a thing for half the time, yeah. and getting more jumpy, and then it came, and I wrote enough so that I got a good paper. Good. Paper now, grade. when we were talking about setting this meeting up, one of the things you called me about was actually to talk about your husband's service, which we'll get to. But yes. in conversation with you, we also brought up what you were doing during the war. And you mentioned that in high school, you started out by helping out. And do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I'd be glad to. The Woolworths, 5 and 10, in the middle of Harvard Square, was going to sell um, savings stamps. Pe young people especially put them in a little paper book, and when they had the book filled, they could buy a $25 savings bond, which would help the war effort. And Mother and I, saw in the Cambridge Chronicle newspaper that Mrs. Porter was having a large lawn party, and her house was Lowell's house, the poet Lowell, mm -hmm. a large house and a huge lawn and pretty gardens. We both went, and when my mother got through, she said to me, Faith, 
I'm going to be air raid warden in our apartment house of 18 apartments. And I said, well, I'm going to sell saving stamps in the five and 10 one, one day a week. And I met a friend for life who did it with me. Uh, that. So you were, were you in high school at the time when this was yes, going on? Yes, I was probably a junior in high school and did it through the summer uh, into my senior year, I believe. And this was a volunteer position? Yes. What was it like for you living in Cambridge before the war broke out? Well, I... My biggest thing was being in brownies and then flying up with quite a ceremony to Girl Scouts. And I continued in Girl Scouts. And some people didn't realize that during the war, there were senior service scouts. And I was one of those. After I completed my, all my, um, merit badges for Girl Scouts, I went into the Senior Service Scouts. And what did you have to do for that? Uh, not too much as I remember, but it was helping different projects that were uh, helping the war. One of them, uh, the Unitarian Church and Christ Church were on each side of a cemetery in Cambridge. The cemetery was very old. It went back to uh, Longfellow and George Washington's day. He stayed in the Longfellow house, slept there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the uh, Christ Church had a bullet hole in it from that time. And um, the, there was um, wrought iron metal fence, one of the black painted fences mm -hmm. between Unitarian Church and Christ Church. And um, they were going to tear that up and send the scrap metal to be melted and used for airplanes, ships, whatever, in war work. So I was one who gathered the day they did that and terrible noise all through. But when they took the parts apart, I could lift as much as the boys into a truck. And another truck came, and I think three trucks were loaded full with the fencing. And it was never replaced, uh, but looked natural without it, too. Mm -hmm. And um, that was something I enjoyed. <laughs> sure. And um, at one point, the Charles River needed to be cleared. It was full of tires and uh, leftover refrigerators, whatever was junk to someone, they would find a spot toward the river to go and throw it. <laughs> and literally, from both sides of the river up to Watertown, people um, gave their time, and we went into the river some and retrieved these uh, assorted things which weren't needed, and some were metal, and there again, they could melt the metal and reuse it. And the third thing that I remember on the radio, um, they told of the record store in Harvard Square was accepting old Victrola records, some that you didn't want and didn't need because they were made of rubber. And in melting those down, they could make rubber tires for cars, jeeps, trucks. And uh, I remember carrying a load, walking to the square about a mile, and carrying a large handful of records that were very heavy by the time I got near Harvard Square. But I was determined, and I got them to the record store. 
and they were surprised at the quantity of where is your car. <laughs> and you said you had walked. Yes. <laughs> what did you know about Europe and Asia before the war? Well, we had good history and good geography, even in grammar school. Almost more school, more, more in grammar school than high school with the courses that I took were more English and writing. Um, the, uh, I knew of England and Scotland and Ireland and the shape of them on a map. I knew of Europe, ma mainly France, Spain, and Germany. Um, perhaps I didn't know as much about Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, I... And what about Asia? Asia, <clears throat> also, we, we really went through a complete world map in school. So Australia was prominent, and uh, the continent of Asia with India and uh, Burma, and perhaps that was about it in that area. Now what about some of the events that were happening? Were you aware of uh, the aggressions in Germany and with the Japanese? Yes. What, what did you hear? What were you hearing? Well my dad every dinner time would have the news on and Lowell Thomas as well and uh, after the news and weather they would cover um, Europe completely, and Germany's first move was toward Poland. And it was shocking to think that the people gave up. They, it seemed as if whole families, when someone knocked on the door, we don't know on this end what the repression was to induce them to leave their home. And uh, when they went on freight trains, just filled with people. And did you hear about that happening? I heard it, and I saw it in the news mm -hmm. in the university theater when we went to the movies. And talk about going to the movies. Do you remember going back then and oh, what yes. it cost or what the atmosphere was like and I what you watched? the cost was 50 cents. It was on Saturday and it might have been a dollar on Tuesday when my dad had his day off. And um, he would announce to us the day before or that morning, uh, why don't we go to the movies? And he'd know what was playing more than we did and what didn't matter, we'd go. And um, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers were terrific. And in between the main feature and a B movie, two movies for the price of one in those days, there would be news. And it was frightening to see fire and bombs and so forth. And they told of Poland and the people, whole families who left home and in the end were killed mm -hmm. one way or another, the gas chambers. So I was um, probably 14, 16, 18, something in there in age, so I was old enough to know that these were real people, not movie stories, and um, it bothered me. Mm -hmm. And at home, the family would say, um, what did you hear in the news? Mm -hmm. And I would repeat almost the whole thing, mm -hmm. and they'd say, we were religious people, church every Sunday, and uh, they said, what you want to do, Faith, is think of those people with love. Mm -hmm. And also, God is life, and God will care for them one way or another. 
and this just made me feel much better. And whenever I had a chance to pray or think about religion, I would include the people in Europe and Asia. And speaking of Europe and Asia, um, and we, we hit lightly upon the Japanese aggression. Oh, Do yes. you remember where you were bef uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? Or do you remember that I remember that day? my feelings. What were they like? Uh, just complete shock that how could our, it was our base at Pearl Harbor in the Solomon Islands or Hawaiian? Hawaii. Uh, Hawaiian mm -hmm. Islands. And it didn't seem possible that people could bomb and completely tear apart places and people uh, deliberately, and there was a, a flight of planes, a large number of planes went over Hawaii, and um, they, uh, they just obliterated parts of it and the people. And our American boys who were in the Naval Yard there and the Air Force there, and the discouraging part when I learned it again in the news in the theater, the president knew somehow Washington had word that the Japanese were going there, going in that direction. Now did you know that at that time did that come out or did that come out that, after the fact? It was known then but it came to we people maybe months later, six months or so, that we heard that either the Senate or the President or people in control in Washington knew but did not tell everyone there. Now when, when you <clears throat> mentioned, this was when you were probably around 14 or 15. Yes. So after that is when you started out as a senior service scout, I assume. Yes. And you mentioned your mom, that mm -hmm. your mom was going to help out. And talk about her role. When did that happen? Uh, about the same time, mm -hmm. she was contacted after the lawn party at Mrs. Porter's home and asked <clears throat> we were all uh, not encouraged, but it was demanded that everyone put up black um, air raid curtains on their house as soon as it was dark, four o'clock, five, and those curtains had to completely cover the window. And could you to use bottom side to side? And could you use any kind of black material, or did they? A very thick material, and all of a sudden, the places you buy material had had it in thick, very long rolls, uh, almost similar to the thickness of velvet, but it was a more serviceable cotton type, but thick. So every night before dusk, you would close these curtains? Yes. And during the day, you would have them open? Right. And in closing and those curtains, you could then still have your lights on in the house? Inside. Mm -hmm. And one of my mother's jobs was to go outside and look at every single window all around the entire apartment complex. And if she saw one speck of light, she would go back in the house, ring their bell, and say, please check your, your curtains in your back bedroom, for instance, and uh, a little light is showing, please take care of it. And what was her title? What was that that you mentioned um, she was? Air Raid Warden. And it was, was it just for your apartment building? Just for our apartment, which was fairly large. And one thing she had to do to begin with was purchase at some um, some government building in Boston, in Cambridge. Um, there was a warehouse where she purchased tin pails, um, 
like a pail you'd use in your kitchen, that size. And then she had to get bags, huge bags of sand and fill each pail with sand and put a shovel in it. And if the, <laughs> I think if an airplane came, I don't think that amount of sand would have <laughs> really done a lot of good, but that was what it was for. In what way? What would they have used it for? If, if a bomb came through the ceiling okay. and started a fire, you'd run to the door, get the pail of sand, and shovel sand onto the burning spot. <laughs> now we, we never had to do it. Now, when that goodness. was happening, did you think it was silly, or did you think it was important to do that? Oh, I was so proud of my mother for being a warden, and not a bit silly. It sounded as if that would take care of any bomb that was dropped, which uh, turned silly later. But. Um, she was very uh, concerned about her job and very faithful about it. And beside that, every Tuesday, she went to the sewing group. And that was, oh, maybe 10 ladies on the way between our house and high school. And the day she was there, I would stop by and talk with the women whose names I knew by them. And I would say, what can I do for you? Well, Faith, could you thread this needle? And what oh. were they sewing? They were sewing things for families in Europe or in the Asian area. I never knew where they went, but Mother did. Uh, and we had to make a trip into Boston, both of us carrying a large um, bag of some kind with the clothing in it. And this led to our knitting after that. And she was in charge of knitting for the church. Um, it was scarves in khaki or navy, hats, the kind that you put all over your head and ears, and there was a two and, inch. And were they for the servicemen? Yes, they were for servicemen, and mittens as well. And she was very good at sewing mittens, um, because you used four needles, and then you got down to using two. And some of the women would come with their project, and. I don't know what to do now to finish off the mitten at the, at the end. And uh, the same with stockings. They'd make socks that were quite long up toward the knee. And uh, the feet were a project that some got into trouble with. And mother would bring home two knitted pieces that had come in and she'd say, Faith, there were dropped stitches all over this garment, and I'm going to tear it apart. And I said, I can do the taking apart, Mother. Then she would stretch it. She had a stretcher to put the yarn on, which was all wiggly from knitting, and then dip it in water, or soap and water, I'm not sure now. Then she'd dry it all in the bathtub in, in the room. And then reuse it? Then use it again and remake that person's piece, whether it was a sweater or sure. a, a scarf. Did you have family and friends who enlisted in the armed services? Many. Many family members or friends? Many family members mm -hmm. who were cousins. I had, um, mother had two brothers and three sisters, and each one had family, and they were older than my brother, who was, uh, would have been 18 at some part of the war, and would have gone into the war had he not died at 16 of pneumonia. Um, there were, Billy was in the, the Navy before the war. He was in for life. And uh, his brother, Nelson, 
stayed home but did so much war work you can't imagine what help he was. Sonny, my cousin Larry, went into the service, the same age as my brother. Then Aunt Reba and Uncle Lon had no children, but they were in Florida, and he was sent to an air base in Florida to do the lighting, and he did all of the lights for the field. Mm -hmm. And that part of Florida became Orlando. Oh my, and it wasn't Orlando at the time. Not at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, his war work and who else? Um, and did they oh, all Catherine. make it back okay? Yes, fortunately, yes, everyone. And, and did you we write to servicemen at all? All the time to the cousins, and then there were friends. Jack Hawkins was a good friend of mine, the same age as David and Billy, and uh, he uh, went to California in the Navy, and was near Catherine, who was another cousin. Her brother, Robert, was in the Air Force, and he went off to England, and from there to Europe, back and forth, and he came home too. Catherine stayed in California. She was in the waves, and she came home for a visit after the war, and then said, I'm going back, and spent most of her life in California. And now, when you, rent, when you wrote to these uh, friends and family mm -hmm. members, do you feel that your letters were important to them? And do you remember what you wrote about? Because you were only a young woman. They said they were important, so it kept me writing them. And um, also Buddy on my dad's side, Cornelius Crosby Webster, was in the service. But when I wrote, um, I'd say, oh, it's beautiful weather. The leaves have been gorgeous, things like that to start with. And then I'd say, what are you doing? Tell me about your work a little bit. And they'd write back, I can't tell you a thing <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, the, res the censorship and restrictions were strong. And when letters that I saw that David sent to his family, he'd describe where he was, what he was doing. There would be holes in the letter. Now, David. Cut right out, my husband. Your husband. Okay. Uh, we'll get he, to him yes. in a minute, okay? But um, that showed me why they didn't tell much. And then in the end, I'd tell them, oh, I'm doing well in school, I got an A on a paper, and um, uh, I'm working for the town, taking a fence apart. <laughs> now, when you were um, doing that volunteer work, were you still in high school? Yes, and, most of the time. And then when you, when you went to Wheelock? Um, I went from high school in my junior year my dad pulled me out because the same Latin teacher I had as a freshman was having me as a junior. And she had a strange, strange way of giving you 100% if you would write a rhyme about some grammatical Latin um, words to tell you how to remember that and where you put it in a sentence and so forth. And I got a lot of hundreds, but when it came to um, her tests in Latin, I would come home with wrong, wrong, wrong. And my dad would say, let me see your paper, Faith. He'd had Latin in Harvard. He said, this one's right. The second one's right. The fourth one's right. What was she doing? <laughs> We're going to school at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And I said, what about your work? I'll get there, but we're going to school, to Miss, this woman's class, and I will talk with her. And she, oh, I'm sorry, you're right, Mr. Webster. Oh, this one's right. Well, how could I do this? And 
the grade went from zero to near 100. And uh, he said, this is enough. She's starting the same thing, and we're going to go to another school. I was taken out just when I had been very happy to be on the committee for the Athletic Association. Girls. And this is at Cambridge? Cambridge High and Latin. High and, Latin. Mm -hmm. and uh, so they had a, a going away party for me, the committee, and that pleased me. And I said I'd keep in touch, which I did. I would go back certain times when I could, when they were there. And um, I was sent to Brimmer and May School in Boston, a very good private school. And my best friend Suzanne from grammar school was going there. And all of a sudden, her, her father, from being um, next to the head of the astronomy uh, department at Harvard, was suddenly sent to Washington, D.C. So here I was without my friend, but in a school that I really liked. So you did part of your junior year and your senior year yes, there? Yes, and graduated from Brimmer May. And then did you go right into Wheelock from there, or did you take some time off? No. Well, let's see. I went right into Wheelock. And I, while uh, you were I applied to Radcliffe, which the principal of Brimmer and May said, Faith, I would not do it. Um, she had gone to Bradcliffe and found it very, very difficult. And she said, your grades here are good, but they're, the high school ones don't compare well with private school grades. And you might not be accepted. I don't want you to be disappointed. Sure. But I, I applied anyway. And I applied to Wheelock and one other can't remember now. And while you were at Wheelock, did you work also, or did you just strictly go to school? With commuting on the subway, um, going to Charles Street, running Charles Street when I was late, and then repeating the trip back, it was there wasn't time enough to work during weekdays. But Saturdays, I had some kind of funny job in a restaurant. I mean, it was picking up and um, more dishwasher type mm -hmm. thing, uh, but it was a job and I was paid for it and it was near the college. What um, Do you think your work, your volunteer work, contributed to the war effort? Well, at the time I felt it did. Mm -hmm. It was requested to take that fence down and to take records to the record store to be demolished. And um, the R Charles River was navigable after um, our job of clearing the sculpture out. And uh, that meant that from Boston Harbor, <clears throat> small ships could go through the, there was, there were docks, I mean, locks in, at the end of the Charles River before you got into the harbor. And small ships could go into the lock and through the locks into the safer Charles River mm -hmm. and would do that and sometimes unload along the Charles instead of uh, in the harbor. What was your apartment houses? like? Do you remember? Yes, we lived on the third floor. And uh, it was a bedroom, a beautiful large living room, a hallway, a um, good-sized dining room where I slept in a day bed, and a kitchen that was very usable. Down in the basement was the laundry, which we could use. And um, they had even drying racks um, um, powered by gas. Mm. Gas pipes went through the place you hung the clothes. But during the war, with cutting back on gas, those were, 
they stopped using those. And that was fine with mother. We had a place to hang things. And, uh, and you mentioned earlier about listening to Lowell Thomas on the radio, I yes. assume. And also going to the movies. Are these the major ways you heard about the war effort? Well, did news you also newspapers, newspapers as well. Mm -hmm. My father would buy the Christian Science Monitor on his way home every night. And on going to work, he'd buy the Boston Herald in the subway. At that time, there were um, little stores in each subway station. Like kiosk type yes, stores? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And they sold candy and gum and newspapers and magazines. And one time I remember I was delighted. He came home one Wednesday night from work and said, Faith, I have a present for you. It was the first copy of the Seventeen magazine. Oh, my goodness. And really? And I had a subscription after that and kept getting those for a while. Do you remember when that was? Well, when was I? Seventeen. Twenty-seven. Three. Uh, Forty-four. Nineteen forty-four. You're quicker. <laughs> Tell us about rationing. Do you remember? Yes. And, and shortages of clothing, or I know nylons were, nylon stockings. Uh, weren't any. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, the rationing, we had red stamps and blue stamps. And there was another, like a white stamp, but that didn't buy much. Um, for meat or butter, you used a red stamp. And they were in denominations of 5, 10, 20. And that would be dollars. Butter wouldn't be $5, so it must have been a blue stamp for butter. But any kind of meat was red. And the blue um, bought some canned goods, especially Spam or something was blue stamp and butter and uh, um, vegetables and so forth. And then the white stamps together bought, um, well, candy bars, gum. Um, it was, there was quite a lot that was rationed. So would you eggs, go to? A regular grocery store. And that, is that where you would get your stamps? You would you, buy the stamps? You would be sent the stamps, and you would apply for them when you were low on any okay. color. And they'd be mailed to you and come immediately. And um, a regular grocery store, when you went to the cash register, you'd pay for your your things, but first you would put down the needed stamps. If you didn't have enough stamps, that piece of groceries would go back on the shelf. Okay. <clears throat> and nylons, when I became 16, I got my Social Security card or my working papers at that time. I'd had a card, but uh, you had to have working papers to work at the age 16. And I went in where my dad was and went to the publishing house and asked for a job. Yes, we have a job for you. <laughs> and if you remember department stores that had the pneumatic tubes, they'd put money into something and push it and it would go up a tube across ceilings up to another floor and something would come back the same way, and that girl would take it. It was change for a $50 bill, maybe, or uh, receipts would come that way. Well, in the publishing house, the tubes were much bigger. They were about this size. And the, there were leather containers this size, and they would be shot into the tube and 
I was at a tube station at, in the outgoing mail department of, <laughs> of the publishing house. And when a tube came, I'd have mail to give to the person I worked for who was in charge there. And then I would have mail for the, uh, oh, the quarterly uh, committee, the foreign language committee, uh, and different on different floors from where I was. So now, did you I, do this part time or full time? No, this was full time job in the summer. I think I worked one summer or two. Do you remember what you wore to work? No silk stockings. They mm -hmm. were made of cotton. They were cotton, there was a name for them, lace, uh, cotton, something. And then you had to wear skirts <clears throat> or skirts, dresses? Dress skirts and stockings every day in the hot 90 degree weather, those cotton stockings were something. But I got used to them and wear stockings today, so. Did you have a victory garden? Yes. My dad and I knew Mr. and Mrs. Brewer, who were, he was uh, in the School of Education at Harvard, and he said to dad, you know, I have a beautiful garden on his street and backyard, and we'll be away all summer. Would you, Bert, like to use it? And your daughter, perhaps? Well, we were delighted. And the first thing, we bought two dozen tomato plants, <laughs> which were quite a bit. And. Um, when we came home with a ripe tomato, we'd put a mark on the calendar, and four marks or whatever. And we four marks meaning if you four, brought four, four tomatoes okay. that day, and we continued through the summer. So you and, kept track of how many you got. <laughs> and Dad and I would know why we had two hundred and seventy-six tomatoes that summer, <laughs> and more the next summer. But it was fun and uh, gave us something to do after work. And we'd walk together a few blocks. And uh, that was good because we talked together well. And uh, when did you meet your husband? That was in 1949. So this was after the war? After the war. David came home in 46. So he hadn't been home too long. And when I met him, I thought, what a beautiful glow on his face. He had a bronzed face that wasn't makeup. It was all over his face and hands. And he had been four and a half years in the service, the Army Engineers, and two and a half years of that were in India. And I can start from the beginning if you want. Well, he, he joined the service and he obviously took basic training. What took him to India? Uh, his basic training was Fort Devens mm -hmm. in Air, Massachusetts. And he um, well, from there he went to Richmond, Virginia, which is the picture that um, I have. And then to uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. And the major in charge gave them a talk. I am not military. I have spent my life in the oil fields. And I will teach you everything that I ever learned about gasoline and oil. And that's what you're here for. And I don't care about the military part. Someone else does. <laughs> and uh, he learned a great deal from this uh, major. And uh, from there, he was sent to Riverside, California, beautiful orange trees, and went off you know, on a ship, not knowing where he was going. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was 
uh, probably a few months after New Orleans. They sent them out pretty fast. He was less than a year in the States training and then went to, uh, to Calicunda, first Calcutta, India. They stopped in Australia and left food and lots of ammunition and guns, any kind, and that was their intention, leaving um, the States, because Australia was being invaded by the Japanese on the north, and they came in around from the east to the west and stopped at Perth, Australia. And the Rotary Club gave them all a luncheon, <laughs> the men on the ship who wanted to go, and David went and beautifully welcomed. And um, he was taken to the farm of one of the men who had very little corn growing, but whatever seed he could get, he grew. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, cows and sheep. A <laughs> city boy, he was delighted with all the animals. And um, then went on, on the ship, to the eastern part of India. Uh, and this was his first time overseas? Yeah. He was not a traveled man? No, mm -hmm. he was an educated man mm -hmm. and went to Northeastern. And it was in his freshman year that um, that the bombing of, um, well, December 7th came in his freshman year, and the Japanese had hit hard on Pearl Harbor, and also the Germans started in with their trips into Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Austria, and nobody moved until sure. that now talk about him in India. I know yes. this is obviously third, second and third hand, but he had some interesting information that you wanted to share on this yes. tape. Tell us about that. Uh, after the major taught them about oil, that's what they were doing in India. That was their destination and their job. To find oil? Or well, it came in on the ships. Okay. And if they came into Calcutta, the ships ran aground on mud. And the first job of the engineers was to put um, large piping, either hoses or piping, out into the water. And maybe two miles into the water to the point where ships would be able to come in. And the nozzle would be held up so that the ship could fill it. And that oil or gasoline went to Calicunda, India, where David was stationed. His camp was surrounded by aluminum wiring, uh, like playgrounds were here. And uh, because of the animals, there were cats, bobcats, mountain lion, <clears throat> wolves, whatever, and also snakes. And poisonous snakes were something to deal with. There were black snakes, little ones, which were just fine. They didn't do anything. So they came through the wire in and out, but not the larger ones. And. Uh, this story David told about his best friend, L.G. Rector of Tennessee. Lloyd was walking toward a um, supply uh, cab, a little, uh, a little place where the supplies were kept. And David was behind him. And L.G. opened the door. And as he did, there was a cobra all ready to strike from the noise of their coming toward him. And Lloyd just jumped back out of his shoes, knocked David down, 
They were so lucky. Yes, they really. were. Because well, did he talk about it what scared the snake back in, too, and they okay. shut the door fast. Did he talk about the weather at all? How is that how he got his gorgeous golden glow? It is. Because of the sun? Yeah. The, the regular temperature could be 120 degrees. Now, we're, when we get to 80, we talk about too hot. But can you imagine 100, 110 as a regular uh, temperature, and a hot one was 120. Now talk about one of the projects that the engineers had to do with regards to the um, airplanes coming in. Oh yes. The airfield that they, that he, David was pumping gasoline from where he was to the airfield right next, next to them and it was Calicunda Airfield, one of five airfields that circled Calcutta, built by the British. He became very friendly with the British who were there first and um, taking a lot of this problem early on. Um, when David pumped gasoline, it went to the airfield and from there, there were the little trucks that said, follow me. <laughs> and and um, they uh, led the um, gas or oil trucks to the planes. And he said it was unbelievable, the gallons and hundreds of gallons they pumped into airplanes. He said how they ever took off with the load they had, but they always did. And you also mentioned, uh, prior to making this appointment, about them having to expand the airfield. Talk yes. about that. That was something important. They got word that there was a plane coming. They were used to this size plane, but this was a much larger, much bigger plane, and it would need a much longer airfield so everyone pitched in with Indian coolies, and that was the first time I'd heard that expression. We'd heard of Chinese, but Indian coolies helped build this airstrip again were they area, in the hot weather. Area workers that yes, right, and, and that some were term. called in from uh, small settlements nearby too. And uh, a lot of the women were the ones who worked the rice paddies. And they did it expecting children and stopped at the edge of the rice paddy, had their baby, and went back into the rice paddy. And did working. your husband witness any of that? Oh, yes. He did. You mm -hmm. could see it from the trains, mm -hmm. or you'd stop um, on a train trip right by a rice paddy mm -hmm. and see the women up to here, I guess, in water, and, um, and very diligent workers. Well, they got the airfield made the length that they were requested to do it. And um, at that point, they were expecting the plane. And this huge plane arrived and came and safely landed and used a good deal of the air f airfield to land. And that was the Enola Gay. People who know of World War II know that the Enola Gay had in its um, container, it ha was carrying the atom bomb, the very first one, which President Truman gave the order to use. And the Enola Gay went from this airfield to Tinian Island, which we hear about that it went from Tinian, but not that it stopped first in India. While it was there, did your husband see it and know what it was all about? He, he saw the airplane, and it was uh, really unbelievable how they built a plane that large. He was used to B-52 
B-54s and B-17s. And this was, oh, I can't tell you now, but um, this plane was a larger, maybe double what they were used to seeing. And did it have security around it when it landed? Oh, yes. So you couldn't get near it? Uh, he went to the airfield to do his job of delivering gasoline, but stopped at a certain area, and that was true. The coolies left and were not seen anywhere around. The regular Indians were not around at the time this plane landed. Do you know how long it stayed there before it went to Tinian? I think a very short time, because the weather was right, the daytime, um, I think it had had night over the ocean and arrived early morning. So it was the time to fly to Tinian after they refueled, the reason they stopped. And uh, so David got as close a book as other people did, and not too many saw it completely. And uh, he remembered that. and from Tinian, that plane went to t over Tokyo and dropped the first atomic bomb. Did he say what happened or how he heard about it and he knew that he actually had witnessed part of history? They had um, the armed service radio, you've heard of that today, and the, the armed services radio told that a large plane arrived, they didn't say where, and it went to an island and they didn't name it. And this was after the bomb was dropped, but the United States was not loved in that area after the atomic bomb. And um, President Roosevelt knew the bomb was being made. He uh, he even agreed that the group, a small group, including Professor Bunch, Bush Bunch, um, from Harvard, um, and Oppenheimer, you've heard of, worked on it. And Franklin Roosevelt knew that it was being made, or invented anyway, and he also said, I will not use it. But when Truman came into the White House, President Truman said, this is the time to use it. We will have our men and boys in Europe and Asia and all, all across the water for years if we don't take this opportunity. As a young woman back in the States, what do you remember about the impressions that you felt or you were seeing once the bombs were dropped? The bomb was a shock to people because it was so devastating and so tremendous. Uh, if you can picture the city of Boston and a good part of its suburbs just flattened, burned to crisp, um, people didn't have uh, notice early enough to leave Tokyo. It was just an immediate huge plane and boom uh, from what we saw on, tele on, <laughs> on the movies, the movie news, mm -hmm. yes, and the newspaper showed um, the devastation in many pictures. And in, do you think you received accurate information from the movie screen and the news coverage? Accurate as far as it went, yes. Um, we didn't hear it all. That came to me from David's lips uh, when I met him the years later uh, because um, the newspapers were not allowed to give the whole story. Thousands of people lost their lives. Mm. 
and the plane was safe. The plane um, came back to, I don't know, well, it went to Tinian probably and then was fixed a bit and then sent home. You had mentioned earlier about David writing to family and having a lot of his letters censored. Did, did they save those letters? Did you ever see them? They saved every single letter in a shoebox mm -hmm. or two shoeboxes. I've forgotten now. But uh, we used V-mail, um, very thin mm -hmm. blue paper that was put in a V-mail envelope with red, white, and blue around the edge and V-mail clearly on the front. And that was, on their end, it was free mail. Any serviceman could mail a letter and write free where the stamp would go. We in the States would put stamps on, mm -hmm. but didn't mind that if we could <laughs> communicate. And his, his letters are what I saw, a letter this size with a slice out there and a slice out here and a big hunk here. And then you turned it over and there were more slices, but what was on the front obliterated part of the back. The back. Sure. And um, but you heard you read enough to know that he was well. He would put that in the beginning, and also in the end. I have a great tan. <laughs> <laughs> that tan lasted oh eight or ten years. What do you think? What did you think then, and what do you think now regarding the war effort? I think we did such a good job. It needed to be done. The, the countries near Germany, Poland, a huge country, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Austria, were, the Germans walked in, did what they wanted, did away with whatever number of people they wanted to. Um, they filled freight cars full of people sent to concentration camps, and you may hear in today's news, there was no such thing as a concentration camp in Germany. Oh no, we know there were, but today's news some of the time is trying to tell us the Germans never did that, never put people in those camps, mm -hmm. but they did. Mm -hmm. And p there are enough people still around to say we saw them, we saw the results. Mm -hmm. We People were blinded, deafened, le lost limbs, whatever. And um, the movie you might have seen, it was one movie that showed that clearly uh, trying to think, there were two women actresses in it. One of the women went to Germany and was, was taken and put into a concentration camp. And the other woman knew where she left from, went there and traced the steps of this other woman who was a beautiful violinist. And she didn't have the worst jobs in the concentration camp, cleaning up and uh, digging ditches and different things were hard jobs in, without good equipment. Sure. But um, this woman was put into the orchestra. Yes, I think it, it, it's ba the movie is based on a true story, yes, I believe. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Are there any thoughts or memories as we wrap this interview up? Are there any thoughts or memories you'd like to share with us and with those who will be watching your interview? Anything to finalize well, your interview? I got to know David, as I said, in 1949 through my friend Susie, best friend all my life still today. Um, we went to square dancing on Thursday night every other week. And I'd go home and my mother would say, well, 
were you Bob's date or David's? And I'd say, both. <laughs> <laughs> the four of us just interchanged. And when Susie moved to Texas, uh, David said, well, let's keep going. So we did another year. And in that year, we got to know each other even better. David was an ice dancer at the Skating Club of Boston and invited me as his guest frequently. And there we got to know each other even better. He was dance committee chairman and I helped him with that and a New Year's party and beautiful things happening there. A Sunday afternoon tea every Sunday and Friday night family dancing and Wednesday night dance night for couples. And uh, we just talked each other into getting married. Sure, sure. <laughs> and, um, and when did you get married? In 1951, in June, we were married at the Harvard Church, at Harvard Memorial Church, and we had a reception at the boat club right on the river. And we, they had Japanese lanterns there. They took them out and they were put on all the lights on the porch. And our receiving line was out on the porch. My dress was on a, a white sheet, thanks to my mother and uh, my bridesmaids. And uh, there were four and six ushers. It was a delightful time, and uh, we could see boats going by, and they'd look up and say whatever, and, and hello, and best wishes. <laughs> um, so you married at, on the water, and for most of your married life, you were on the water in Hyannis? Yes. We lived in Cambridge, however, mm -hmm. and my husband was working in the family business, Howard F. Peake and Sons Roofing Company with copper roofs, copper gutters, conductors, um, uh, asphalt shingles, wooden shingles, flat roofs, sloping roofs, the works. Mm -hmm. And he worked from Cambridge to Belmont, Watertown, Newton, any of the suburbs, as well as Cambridge. Brattle Street was a favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he kept that going. And I would go summers at his request. I would take the girls to a house we bought on the water in Hyannis, next to the family house, as it happened. The, a friend came to David and me and said, I want to ask you something. I'm going to buy a summer, a year-round home on the Cape. Would you like to buy our summer house? And <gasps> we were married two years. And buy a vacation house and not a living house in Cambridge. Well, he, you're right in style. I've heard a number of in, younger individuals doing that very thing now Go today. Ahead. That they are in an apartment or a condo for their first few years and they buy their second home first. And many of them have been very, very pleased. Well, to I'm have glad done they that. followed our sure. lead because David kept working. And um, he'd come weekends, Friday night in all the traffic, which became heavier, but wasn't too bad in the beginning. And then he'd go back Sunday night to Cambridge to work. And uh, then he found that Sunday night was complicated, so he'd stay till, sun till Monday, Monday morning. morning. Mm -hmm. And in the fall, we'd still be have that Cape House open. So Monday morning, I'm writing a note, please excuse <laughs> two daughters from um, school. From school. Sure. They're, they're coming late because we came up from the Cape. And uh, a teacher came to me, asked me to come, and said, you know, Mrs. Pete, 
I have the house on the Cape, but I come back Sunday <laughs> night. I should think you could. And I would say, well, I don't drive. But my husband comes on Sunday, on Monday morning. We could take the bus. And she said, no, I didn't mean to imply that. Sure. <laughs> well, Faith Peak, we want to help you. This was a fascinating story, not only about your life, but about a little bit about your husband's adventures or ventures during his time in World War II. So thank you so much for sharing oh, it with us. Thank you very much, Ms. Craig. I'm so pleased that you wanted to have this story. We're glad you came in. Thank you. Thank you.